With more than 6,000 small and micro-cap companies listed, if you're looking for the next Apple, at the earliest stage, then Channel Check truly is the orchard. The listed companies support Channel Check, so it's free for you, the potential investor, to gain access to institutional quality research from FINRA licensed analysts, advanced market data, industry reports, news, and a growing catalog of videos and webcasts. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and register for Channel Check so you're always up to date on what's going on at the small and microcap data place. Welcome to the Transportation Logistics Forum, a NobleCon online investor event, presented by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Noble is an SEC registered, FINRA licensed broker dealer and the source of the equity research available on Channel Check. This presentation features Grindrod Shipping, NASDAQ ticker symbol GRIN, following a brief overview presentation from CEO Martin Wade and CFO Stephen Griffith. Noble Research Analyst Poe Fratt will moderate a Q&A session. With that, I am pleased to present Martin and Stephen. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining our presentation in conjunction with the Noble Capital Markets Transportation and Logistics Forum. My name is Martin Wade, and I'm the CEO of Grinrod Shipping and I will be um, joined by my colleague, Steve Griffiths, uh, the CFO. Grinrod Shipping is one of the leading publicly listed dry bulk operators focused within the smaller geared vessel segment. Our fleet is amongst the youngest of our US public peers with a particular focus on Japanese built uh, eco vessels. The company was listed in 2018 through a spin-off and direct listing from Grinrod Limited. The company has undertaken a significant transformation since its listing by streamlining its ownership structure and focusing on the strength of our dry bulk operating model. Turning to slide floor four. This highlights a differenti differentiated operational approach of Grinrod Shipping. On the commercial side, the dynamic approach of the company includes opportunistically chartering vessels on both long and short time charters in order to service our cargo contracts. Our long-term chartering vessels are contracted at well below current market charter rates and most contain favorable extension options and or fixed price purchase options that are now notably below the current market value. Please see side 16 in the appendix. This allows us the option to pursue growth at prices considerably below prevailing levels in the secondhand and charter markets as evidenced in the recent IVS Phoenix acquisition that we did. In addition, we have been able to complement our core fleet with a number of short-term charter vessels in which we hold a series of charter extension options at commercially favorable levels. Together with our core fleet, which are predominantly Japanese built vessels, these options allow the company to deliver additional upside to shareholders. Now turning to page five to look at the fundamentals of the dry bulk sector. The dry bulk cargoes hit hardest by the global pandemic were coal and minor bulks, while iron ore and grains were far more resilient. Thus far in 2021, we've seen a material pickup in coal and minor bulk demand, which is closely correlated to global GDP. Global energy shortages, in particular natural gas, have caused thermal coal demand to increase materially for power generation. Handy sizes and supermaxes have been further helped by congestion in the container shipping business, which is leading to certain bag cargoes and break bulk cargoes like scrap steel returning to bulk carriers. Now turning to slide six. The charts on the left indicate handy max and supermax charter rates over both the last 15 years to show where we are relative to past strong chartering cycles in the dry bulk sector and over the course of 2021 to highlight rate movements this year. While rates did decline somewhat over the course of November, they have stabilized thus far in December at still very strong levels. On the asset side, prices have consider increased considerably since the lows of late 2020, but remain well below levels reached in 2010, despite higher comparative charter rates. Now turning to slide seven. The dry bulk order book continues to shrink to multi-decade lows and is estimated at only 6.8% of the fleet with approximately 16% of the dry bulk fleet is 15 years or older and approximately 7% of the dry bulk fleet is 20 years or older, measured by DWT, which is dead weight. Despite strong market conditions, new ordering remains constrained 
by uncertainty relating to engine technology and emissions. 2021 and 2022 supply growth is forecasted to be 3.5% and 1.5% respectively, with handy size and supermax order books are the lowest in the dry bulk fleet at 4.5% and 5.9% respectively. Now we turn to slide eight and I'll hand you over to Steve. Thank you, Martin. Uh, my name is Steve Griffiths. I'm the CFO of Grinrod Shipping. All right, so turning to slide eight. The company recently initiated a flexible dividend and capital return policy. Our key focus was to create a simple, transparent, sustainable capital return policy that allows the company to retain significant cash to further strengthen the balance sheet and pursue growth while rewarding shareholders with material dividends and or share repurchases in times of market strength. The company intends, subject to operating needs and other circumstances, to return approximately 30% of its adjusted net income, adjusted for, ordinary, for extraordinary items to shareholders through a combination of quarterly dividends and or share repurchases. The company intends to pay a minimum quarterly based dividend of three cents per share and an additional variable component that will consist of additional dividends and or share repurchases. For the third quarter of 2021, the company declared a dividend of 72 cents per share and repurchased 1.4 million in shares. We expect that the return to shareholders will be primarily in the form of dividends, though the company retains the right to adjust the allocation to maximize value to shareholders based on market conditions share price levels, share liquidity, and other related matters. To that end, we recently announced that we acquired just over 3% of our shares outstanding in open market share repurchases since our third quarter earnings release, as we believe share repurchases at current share prices are highly attractive for shareholders. Now turning to slide nine. The scale of the rise in the dry bulk freight rates thus far in 2021 is easily demonstrated versus our historical results. During the first nine months of 2021, approximately 90% of the fleet was predominantly trading either on index-linked cargo contracts, short-term time charters, or in the spot market, leaving us exceptionally well positioned to take advantage of the strong freight, freight rate environment. To put this into context, with every $1,000 uh, change in TCE per day, equated to approximately 2.7 million of TCE revenue during the third quarter of 2021 for the core fleet. Please turn to slide 10 for an overview of our third quarter and nine months 2021 financial highlights. During the third quarter and first nine months of 2021, Greenwich Shipping achieved stronger results as compared to the same period 2020, taking full advantage of the robust market conditions and the earnings power of our expanded owned fleet following the acquisition of the remaining portion of our RVS bulk subsidiary. For the third quarter, 2021, we generated record gross profit, adjusted EBITDA, and adjusted net income of $62 million, $69 million, and $45.8 million, or $2.38 per ordinary share, respectively. The respective figures for the nine-month period, 2021, were $110.2 million, $131.5 million and $68.5 million, or $3.56 per ordinary share. Our long-term charted in break-even was $14,171 per vessel per day, and overall core dry bulk break-even was $11,743 per vessel per day. The cash break-even rate per day includes operational expenses, net GNA, interest expense, and debt repayment. On slide 12, <clears throat> we provide our bank loans and other borrowings repayment profile at September the 30th, 2021. The strong operational and financial performance of the first nine months of 2021 has allowed the company to strengthen its cash liquidity and reduce its net debt to 167.1 million from 237.2 million at year-end 2020, while simultaneously pursuing growth initiatives such as the RVS bulk transaction. Limited debt maturities until 2025 combined with a conservative amortization profile provide us with balance sheet flexibility going forward. I'll hand you back over to Martin. 
Thanks, Steve. Turning to slide 13. And this contains our conclusions and strategy. Let's start with our achievements at the beginning of 2021. The strong dry bulk market conditions led to our highest financial results since our spin-off and listing with the sale of all our remaining spot trading product tankers that has allowed us to focus on dry bulk at an optimal time. During the last quarter, we completed the acquisition of the remainder of IVS bulk joint venture with an attractive valuation. On the commercial side, the, the dynamic approach of the company that includes opportunistically chartering of vessels on both long and short term charters in order to service our car cargo contracts is bearing significant fruit. On the corporate side, having concluded a series of strategic and transformational transactions, we transitioned to quarterly financial reporting. In addition, we declared a 72 cent uh, dividend per share for Q3 under our new dividend and capital return policy, as Steve explained and have repurchased 717,011 shares year to date, including 591,673 shares since our Q3 2021 earnings release. In addition, in the third quarter, we completed our first secondary offering. The company did not sell any shares, but the transaction has benefited shareholders through increased daily trading liquidity, a stronger US institutional shareholder base, and increased market float in the US, which has now reached over 37% of shares outstanding as of October 2021. Now looking ahead, dry bulk freight rates continue to increase in the fourth quarter of 21, although did call materially in November, however, have since stabilized and actually are starting to move up again to, uh, to stand at still historically very strong levels. Freight rates have been supported by rebounding commodity demand and pricing in 2021 across a wide swathe of commodities, including grains, iron ore, coal, and minor bulks. On the positive side also, the smallest new building order book in decades supports market recovery due to constriction in vessel supply growth as demand continues to recover. Due to record amounts of new container ship orders thus far in 2021, even if dry bulk orders were to pick up materially, Limited shipyard spare capacity means that most new orders could not hit the water until 2024 at the earliest. To the extent that demand continues to grow even moderately, the lack of available supply growth leads to an attractive potential multi-year window for the dry bulk market. In this environment, with stronger market fundamentals, we are confident that Grinrod shipping can reinforce its market position and create significant value for our shareholders. With this, I thank you all for joining our call today and look forward to answering any questions from uh, Poe with Noble. Over to you, Poe. Great. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Steve. I really enjoyed your presentation. I have a couple questions um, for you. Um, let's start with the macro. Um, can you talk about how the ultra and super um, markets perform relative to the handy markets and whether they're completely correlated or whether there are differences in each market? That's an interesting question. Um, both have obviously performed ma magnificently. I think what has caught a lot of people by surprise is actually the strength of the handy market. I mean, the, the, the ultras have been e excellent earnings, but the handers have really benefited from all the issues on, on the liner side with, with the delays and uh, an awful lot of uh, bulk cargo coming back out of containers going into into handy uh, handies now and also with uh, with on these routes it's ton sea miles so i think this is this is what's really pleased us whereby oh, obviously you normally get quite a big differential between ultras uh, supers ultras and handies and the handies really have outperformed this year almost for, from the beginning of the year so that's been incredibly positive and yes, they are pretty closely correlated but because obviously a percentage of handy cargo can always go in, in, into supers ultras, uh, depending on, on, on port restrictions, if one gets out of kilter with the other. But uh, basically the handy, it's a really, that's been, the, I think, the star market all year. And, you know, one thing we've heard is that, you know, the energy markets have been pretty tight. Um, you know, LNG prices have spiked. Uh, that's made coal a little more economic you know, and higher coal shipments have helped the market. What's your longer term view on the coal market? 
it, it, I suppose it's a little bit like uh, the end of oil, the end of coal. I, I don't think so yet. It, it's obviously uh, in Asia, an awful lot of coal-fired power stations are, are being built, and, and it's still the cheapest form of, of energy for emerging markets. Um, you then add in what, what's happened in Europe uh, with the, uh, the shortage of gas, and, and there's no doubting that some coal-fired power stations having to be, be restarted. So I think coal is very much part of the energy mix. Long term, of course, this has to change, no doubting. But but for the for the time being, if you want instantaneous uh, uh, power, uh, coal is the commodity. And then you you're looking at what's happened in China with the Australian ban, where they've been taking coal from further afield. And then I must say they they did try and slow that down a, a couple of months ago. But as we go with La, uh, the La Nina weather. Uh, uh, happening this year with with incredibly cold winters we are finding that china is having to that the latest is having to import bought more coal india of course uh, came perilously close to running out of coal in a number of power stations so their internal demand their internal supply is ramped up but they also are importing a, an awful lot of coal so it is very positive i don't think coal's going anywhere for the time being and uh and again, you say take America, which is suddenly importing an awful lot of coal to, to India, or exporting a lot of coal to India and, and uh, China, which is long haul. So it's very positive coal. Yeah. And then if you could share with us your outlook for both, you know, both classes as we look into next year, you know, would you address how much seasonality you expect? And then how how congestion in a firmer container market might be factors next year, too? Well, obviously, the, the the one question that we always, when we come to the end of every year, is, is how Chinese New Year is going to impact the market. Um, and of course, this year it it could be a double whammy if it actually happens, because you've got the Beijing Winter Olympics. Uh, so with China, you know, very very keen to keep clear blue skies. But the way the market's looking at the moment, obviously, with this uh, new so-called variant, uh, the Omicron, that's come along. Um, I, again, like last year, I, I don't expect that, that China, China will allow, you know, eight, 900 million people to, to go home. So I suspect that uh, to a similar degree to last year that factories, uh, workers will keep on, on working. And the market is there, demand is there for a lot of commodities. Uh, and if we can get through Q1, you know, the, the forward paper at the moment, which we say super is, is indicating beginning with a two. Well, when we went through last year, it was single figures. Well, this year, single figures. So it could be a very, very good start to the year. And seasonality? Um, yeah, when, when I started in the business, I mean, Q3 was the quiet one because it was summer. Q3 tends to be the, the big one in all markets now. So th there is definitely seasonality. But as we said in our presentation, the lack of ship, new ship supply coming online, and even with a moderate uh, demand growth, as we're seeing, it should uh, enable uh, freight rates to uh, to stay strong. And container congestion, it, it's not the container ships, it's the port logistics that's causing all the problems. So if, if places like America and others are gonna suddenly be, redo their port infrastructure overnight, then, then that congestion will go, that's not gonna happen. So I don't think that that's gonna change anytime soon. And obviously we, we've had the run up to Christmas, but these days, as I, as I said before, just-in-time stockpiles have been replaced by just-in-case. So it's all in all looking pretty positive. And I, I think we've gone at times this year had the most perfect storm for, for dry cargo shipping. So it's very exciting. You just mentioned the order book. You know, it, that really supports a positive view on the supply side. When, when and if do you will the order book expand is that something you expect to happen this coming year or could it be pushed out a little bit further well traditionally the the, the, the lemming owners so let's call them that pile off to the shipyards as soon as rates pick up but but if you cast your mind back to what happened in, in 2003 2004 when when the dry cargo market took off uh, there weren't many yards building ships and those yards were full of container ships and tankers so let's go forward to today's market uh what 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 shipyards there are and it is much reduced for, from the height of 2010 they're full of container ships and, and tankers again so there really isn't the capacity there for, for owners to, to rush off to the yards now add to that the, the doubts about what 
type kind of engine you should be i mean i can't believe that you know within 10 15 20 years we're going to have ifo burning engines so you know is it lng is it ammonia is it hydrogen who knows and if you're an owner buying a ship with, with a 20 year view you've got to be a brave man to order a, a kind of what could well be an outdated uh, ship at, at this point in in time and also with with esg exi coming in I, th I think basically owners have to accept that that we don't know what future technology is going to be so, so hold back so it's again it, it it's exciting because if you're going to rush off to the yards well the earliest you can get ships is 2024 now we all know if you want you know firm dry cargo markets because there are a few ships you want the ships now you're going to be a brave man if you're going to be ordering or lady if you're going to be ordering ships for three years delivery forward so i, I think this is pretty disciplined and and also, I, I think of what were tourist ship owners have exited the market after the heydays. And I think a lot of professional ship owners out there and, and are realizing that, uh, that be, be sensible. Why commit to something, technology that, we, that might not be around or be allowed in, in a few years' time? So it, it, it is, as I said, another perfect storm as far as shipping is concerned with the so much doubt about what we should be ordering. Um, we're, we're not rushing off any time. Despite our relationships in Japan, I was in... You know, in, 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 I left Singapore a couple of days ago, had dinner with, with trading houses. There isn't much left on the order books uh, before 2024. And the prices are, to be honest, quite eye watering. And I think you've got to be a brave person if you're going to order a, a 60,000 ton. It's going to cost you 34, 35 million dollars. That, that's that's 10 million more than we were paying a couple of years ago. So it's going to be disciplined. Great. You talked about, you know, the order book and the impact, you know, of whether it's engine technology or regulations. Can you talk about the near term? You know, we have rules coming in in January 2023. Um, what impact do you think those carbon emission regulations will have on Grinrod in particular and then maybe the industry in general? Well, let's answer it the other way around. And since 2008, shipping CO2 uh, emissions are down over 40 percent and that isn't because every owner suddenly decided to go green and save the world it was purely because the market became so bad everyone slow steams and that suddenly showed everyone that that is the way to reduce co2 so and while ships maybe have sped up a little bit at the moment it's still pretty uh, pretty restrained so i think with exi coming in um there's going to be an awful lot of older ships that really will have to uh either slow steam or pay the penalties so so that is very positive and we as green rod shipping we, we've always ordered japanese uh we, we like the technology we trust the technology and it, it retains its value and going forward with uh with with, with 20 plus uh, ultra modern ships and even with our older ones are all japanese built able to slow steam economically we, we think we're, we're pretty well placed so i think for modern ship owners with modern fleets bring on the regulation and if there has to be carbon taxes well someone's got to pay for it and uh, and let's go forward so i think it's all going to be very positive that you know not the one should welcome more regulation but the right regulation it's going to be very positive for the shipping industry and then you mentioned slow steaming um martin well you know what any prediction on scrapping of older assets do you think that's a possibility obviously dry dry cargo market being firm uh, you're not seeing much scrapping although it was interesting last month there, there were a, a couple of ships scrapped um i think pressures are going to come to bear on on, uh, on owners with this new regulations obviously the scrap price at 600 dollars is very high and could be very attractive and i think you've got to be a brave person if you're going to be trading a uh, you know a 15 to 20 year old ship uh, should we say built at an inferior shipyard in parts of china you're going to be a, you're going to be a brave person to, to to go through this market and risk what could happen the, the other side of it and, and with possible carbon taxes so i think you could see a uh, scrapping increase but again people only do that when when, when they think that they have to or the regulation uh, uh, regulations change so i think we've got to be patient I, I think you'll still see a bit of scrapping but you, you're not going to get owners because at the end of the day if their opex is four to five thousand they're making you know a few thousand dollars a day that's that's what they're making so but but i think looking at it forward with esg and regulation some owners are going to have to realize that their their old fleets 
some of the ships are going to have to be scrapped. Great. Let's switch over to talking about Grinrod shipping. Um, you know, last two years, especially 2021, have been, you know, years of progress. You know, you cleaned up the capital structure, the product tankers were sold, you know, the joint ventures were eliminated, and the fleet has expanded. Um, any thoughts on fleet expansion going forward or fleet composition? You know, many others are selling older assets and buying newer assets. Any thoughts on how your fleet's going to look in five years? So firstly, I agree. It has been a year of progress. Um, you know, currently we do have a, a modern Japanese fleet. Uh, we've got options to purchase five of our of our long-term chartered vessels. However, we do have some older vessels that we'll be looking to sell in the near term, especially in this market. Um, yes, we would like to grow the fleet, but it's likely through through M and A's. And you know, we're constantly on the lookout for transactions that make sense for us. Okay, and then when we look at fuel spreads, you know, they seem to be wired, widening a little bit more with the covering in the energy market. You've said previously that you don't believe in scrubbers. Can you just talk on whether your thoughts have changed on scrubbers? Absolutely not. But 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 but, but, but yes, yes, you're right. Was one hundred and forty-five dollars a ton today? Closer? Um, no, we 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 don't believe in the technology. We we don't think it's clean. But that's a whole other argument. Um, so what happens, of course, it is with the increased uh, fuel price, it just means that, that that the vast majority of the fleet that aren't scrubber fitted, especially on the smaller sizes, will have will steam even slower. Yeah? So it, it's a win win in, in, in that one. But but no, we uh, it's not technology that we we want to, uh, to to get involved with. And also with a modern Japanese fleet, we kind of think it, it defeats the object. So uh, so, yeah, high fuel prices, slower, slower speeds, more time at sea. That's the way we should be going and saving the planet, of course, because of lower CO2. Yep. And then when you look at the, the rates at, you know, the highest levels in, you know, multi-decades, has have higher rates changed your chartering strategy at all? You know, previously you viewed time charters as, you know, unfavorable. Has anything changed your mind on your chartering strategy? Um, not, not, not really. We, we, we prefer to uh, control the control the ships ourselves. We will always, at any any time, uh, maybe have a, have a couple of ships out for uh, for for short period, three to five, four to six months. And uh, and actually, uh, a month ago, we we did put a couple of sixties out at uh, you know very close to forty thousand dollars a day. But it always depends on. It's got to be quality of signature, and and go from there. But what this has meant is that obviously we're not rushing out to take more ships on, on, on long term charter at these levels, but it affords us the opportunity to, to be booking or renewing existing contracts, you know, our core business at vastly higher rates and also look at uh, opportune cargoes if we think it may make sense on, on a forward basis. So we'll always be looking. We always have core clients and uh, and, you know, we, we have rated and concluded some small cargo contracts to 2022. Uh, these were done in September into early October, so great levels. So yes, we, 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 we're we always very flexible in, in that, but uh, we fundamentally, we still believe that the market has further to go. So it is cautious, but it does give us opportunities, yeah. And then any signs of change, you know, with your end customers in the cargo market, you know, are higher TC rates have any, any impact on cargo markets? No, because we, we've obviously we also have higher commodity rates, and uh, I think, and I, I learned donkeys years ago that all the traders are the same. They don't mind paying the same freight rate. What they don't want it is one trader paying ten dollar cheaper freight and having the advantage. So I think we're now into this market where everyone has accepted high freight rates are there, and if they want to get commodities shipped, and of course it does get passed on, on to the end consumer as far as the trader and charters are concerned. So we haven't seen kind of, you know, cargo, you know, even you look at the pickup in cement at the moment, you know, commodities that, that really, a commodity like that normally relies on cheap freight rates. But if demand is there, needs must, it, it, gets, it gets shipped and, and a customer pays, yeah. 
And then when we look at, you know, the built-in growth opportunities that you have, you have options to buy five of the chartered in fleet, you know, at fixed prices. How will you decide whether to exercise those options? And is there any reason to, to exercise early? Yeah, our intention here is to exercise all these options over the next two years. You know, as, as you said, the option prices are all well below current market values. You know, we could either flip the vessels or keep them, but we'll obviously make all of those decisions at the time. You know, and while we have to deploy capital to purchase the ships, you know, the cash cost on each vessel will be lower if we exercise the options and would be significantly lower if we, started, if, we, if we decided to buy the ships without finance. So again, we're going to evaluate this at the time. So yes, we are likely to exercise some of the options early. And then, Steve, your debt maturity profile looks pretty favorable. You know, is there any reason to think that you might take a look at refinancing the 2025 debt at this point in time, or you know, or should it be a pretty quiet year next year as far as financing? Yeah, that's that's you know, the, the, our thinking at the moment as well is there's not going to be much going on. We're comfortable with where we stand at the moment. Um, you know, as mentioned, we may or may not raise finance when we purchase the, the option ships. We've got a strong cash balance, um, you know, but with the current strong market and our current, our current cash position, we could look to, to, to start paying down debt um, during the, the course of next year as well. So, um, yeah, in a, in a very strong position and, 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 you know, at this stage with the current market, um, it's, it's unlikely there'll be much activity on the debt side. Yep, flexibility is really good. Um, and congratulations on declaring the first dividend under the variable dividend policy. You know, you just announced the, you know, numbers for the share buyback, they were a little higher than expected. You know, that means that the cash dividend under the current formula will be lower than it was in the third quarter. You know, is there any way that, you know, how you're thinking about potentially trying to smooth the cash portion of the dividend or will it just be opportunistic and based on what the stock price does relative to where you think the, the value is? Well, absolutely, Pa. You know, we, we have a flexible dividend share buyback policy, you know, and, and, and what we do during the quarter is basically share price dependent. You know, during Q4, we've been aggressively buying back shares as we believe that we're trading at a significant discount. You know, our share price performance subsequent to the publishing of our Q3 results has been somewhat disappointing. I mean, it's not only applicable to our company, but the whole of the dry bulk sector. You know, if you look at our dividend yield on, on Q3 dividend alone, it was roughly 5%. So, so yes, it's, it's going to be flexible and share price dependent. So looking forward, 2022 looks like a pretty good year. Um, what do you think could be the biggest surprise as you look at next year? If it wasn't better than 2021, I mean, the, the, the way rates are, are at the moment, we, we should be coming into the new year at uh, well over double the rates where we started 2021 at with the diminishing order book. Um, maybe some of the demand parameters do, do change a, a little bit, but uh, the line aside, I don't think the congestion is going to go. Demand is there. Uh, steel production outside of China for this year going and looking forward it's is now hitting record levels there's positive news coming out of China with uh, with, with a reduction in in uh, lending margins and uh, it appears Evergrande might be on one side but but the property market looks like it might be recovering a little bit so I would be surprised if uh, if we were here in 12 months time from now and we hadn't posted even better results for 2022 but hey po we know shipping that's not a guarantee but all things considered yeah yep it's like the weather in many places just wait exactly <laughs> but it nonetheless i it looks like a a pretty good you're set up not only because of what you've done over the last two years but how the market looks you know 22 should be you know, a reasonably good year. I really appreciate your time, Martin and Steve. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for participating in our conference. And here's to looking forward uh, to a 2022 that looks interesting. Thank you so Fantastic. much. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Pat.
Thank you for joining us for this NobleCon online investor event presentation brought to you by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Visit our YouTube channel for more video content, including interviews, virtual roadshows, and conference presentation replays. New content is added regularly, so subscribe below to stay up to date. Visit channelcheck.com or click the link in the description to access equity research, news, and advanced market data on this and the 6,000 other small and microcap companies listed. Let me please refer you to slide number two with the forward-looking statement disclaimer. On this call, we will make certain forward-looking statements, including statements regarding our future financial and operating performance. These statements include information regarding future time charter contracts, outlooks for the dry bulk markets, and other operating matters. These statements are based on the beliefs and expectations of management as of today. Our actual results may differ materially from our expectations. Investors should read carefully the risks and uncertainties described in this slide presentation in our most, and in our most recent earnings release, as well as the risk factors included in our annual report and our other filings with the SEC. We assume no obligation to revise or update forward-looking statements, whether as the result of new information, future events, or otherwise, except as required by law. In addition, during this call, we'll be discussing certain non-GAAP financial measures. Additional disclosures relating to these non-GAAP financial measures, including reconciliation to the most directly comparable GAAP measures, please see our most recent earnings release on pages 20 to 22 of this slide presentation, which is posted on our website and our filings with the SEC.